We're going to have an executive session to meet, follow the regular meeting of City Commission pursuant to ORS 192-660-2D to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations and 2I to review and evaluate the employment related performance of the Chief Executive Officer of any public body. So I will now call the regular meeting of the Oregon City Commission to order for Wednesday, October 19th, 2016. Call roll, please. Commissioner Shaw? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Ide? Here. Commissioner Mengelberg? Aye. Mayor Holliday? Here. So please join me in flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have one proclamation, and as is my uh, standard procedure, we're not going to read the proclamation. You can go to the city's website and see it, but this proclamation is declaring November 1st, 2016 as Extra Mild Day. Uh, moving on to citizen comment. Do we have any citizen comments? We do. So Sherry Morish? Is this the right one? It's fine. So you, uh, did you need Could me please to say my name? And name then? and city of residence for the record, please. Okay, my name is Sherry Morish and I live in Malala. Okay. Uh, recently, September-ish, I became the marketing representative for WFMC Studios. Mm -hmm. We're a nonprofit organization just up the street uh, working with government and local businesses and schools and all about the community and I really want WFMC to start reaching out more to the community and offering our services. I didn't realize that part of our reach out responsibility was to talk to the city councils and I was at Milwaukee last night and what an experience I'd never done that before so okay so WFMC is celebrating free speech week this week next year you'll see me a lot sooner we uh, this was a last minute uh, opportunity. Tomorrow is Community Media Day and we're so excited to open up the studio for people who want to produce projects, last minute election promos or PSAs. The studio is open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. You can talk to the receptionist Melody Ashford or Shelly and I'm not going to mess up her last name. Her name is Shelly. Just to correct Melody Ashford is the executive director. She is. <laughs> yes, she is. And but she's she's works with everybody else as well. Right. Um, she will be on site. Uh, we are also <coughs> looking for volunteers for our Halloween event. But anyway, so you can reach WFMC. Their phone number is 503-650-0275. You can also visit the website at WFMCstudios.org. That's WFMCstudios.org. And I also run their Facebook and Twitter accounts. And we're trying to start up a LinkedIn page for them. So keep your eyes open for that as well. I want to thank you all for letting me speak. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank all you right. for coming. Thank I'm, you. I was the uh, I, I was the original board chair of the nonprofit for WFMC. That's as I understand. <laughs> yes, very much. And I actually wanted to meet you um, sooner, but you you walked by me because you were really busy. So I figured there would be another opportunity. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I was not aware. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Any questions? Thank you all. No, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Guile. <coughs> no notes. Uh oh. <laughs> That's right. You got to be careful. Uh, I'm Tom Guile, Oregon City. Um, I came to you tonight because of um, I wanted to find out. Have any of you ever heard of OC, Oregon City Chit Chat? Oh yeah. Have you? Are any of you on it? I lurk. You lurk. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> and that's all you need to do. I want to encourage all of you or anybody of the staff, anybody to get on Oregon City Chit Chat. Nancy, have you seen the string of conversations? I have, yes. I simply asked a question a couple nights ago. I said I get a lot of people in from all over the state today. I had Myrtle Creek in Brownsville. 
and uh, another one from the Dalles, but why don't more Oregon City residents come downtown? I was amazed how many responses. I got over 500 uh, responses to that one um, question. Number one was parking, and that's a whole... it's not so. Oh. Yeah, that's a whole subject on its own. <laughs> Number two was traffic. I think they were mainly referring to the intersection 7th on, on during the uh, rush hour time. Number three was that downtown never advertises or markets anything, and they don't get anything at their home, even though I... I'll explain that in a second. And fourth was the, or fifth was the variety that there's just nothing down there to draw them down. So last night I sat there and you know me with wording. So I wrote a long one about parking, about each of those subjects, and I talked about parking, trying to explain to them about the courthouse and some of the other things. And I actually went down the street and took pictures uh, about three, three thirty in the afternoon of empty streets on, on the side streets, saying there's lots of parking down here. Of course, there was comebacks that we only come down at night and we have to drive around for for 15, 20 minutes to find a parking spot. And so it wasn't a debate, it was more of just a conversation. And some people, the people who run the chit chat were saying, this is great, it opens up a whole new conversation. So we talked about traffic, that was a whole conversation. And I was talking about advertising and marketing, I was trying to tell them that Jonathan does a great job in mailing out to everyone's homes, that brochure that came out last summer of all the events that go on down there. I've put ads in Buy Local, I only got five coupons back, and they were from West Lynn. (laughs) And then I also approached the subject of the variety, and I said, we've had a large variety downtown. Uh, We've had women's clothing and jewelry, but it's hard for those businesses to stay open when we don't get people downtown from Oregon City, our local. And it was a great conversation, no complaining or whining, um, but I'd encourage you to read it because the the remarks were very um, pointed. (coughs) And so many people want free parking, and I think I mentioned to Mayor Dan that maybe uh, several people said, why not open up some of the public, like the city parking lots downtown after five, or put up some signs around that these parking lots are open after six or something like that. But there was a lot of good suggestions there. I know that I talked to Jonathan today and they're working on a parking plan, but there was such a wide variety of topics discussed. And again, it wasn't a big complaint. Well, a lot of people complaining, but it wasn't a big debate. I encourage you to take a look at that and read it. And a lot of good information. Thanks, Tom. I, I, I did slog through the entire lot chain. Um, you know, as we all know, there's been a parking issue in downtown Oregon City since about 1845. Um, <laughs> we are constrained. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that the meters uh, don't run after 5 o'clock. So after 5 o'clock, you know, all the street parking is free. Uh, I know that uh, Carrie Mitchell, who owns the building at the top of the elevator, has a, a lot up there who she has come out and said that after five o'clock people are welcome to use that lot take the elevator downtown um so uh and do we charge we don't charge the lot um on the other on the on the north end of town after five do we i guess there's no sign to tell them i don't think so okay so the other thing we need to sign that then i yeah i think we should do that so that you know the other comment, if you read it, was the elevator stops at 7, so anybody who wants to park up above, uh, and I had some elderly people in the day say, we can't walk back up the steps. So they were talking about if the elevator could stay open longer. Yeah. But any of you who read that, you'll understand what sure. I'm talking about. Sure, and you know that's a discussion I think maybe we, we, should, should, have it. we, should, we should have about keeping the elevator open later. I know that you know, that's, a, that's a budgetary issue that we just have yeah. to talk about whether we can afford to do that or not. Thank you all for reading that, and I encourage anybody who's not on it to get on Oregon City. Thanks for facilitating the discussion, Tom. Wow, what a long discussion it was. (laughs) And you're still invited down to be judges this weekend if you come down to her show and the um, scarecrow contest. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Anybody else that says comment? Okay, then we'll move on. Uh, Everybody okay with the agenda? Yes. Yes. All right. So first up. Second reading of ordinance number 16-1008, <coughs> time, place, and manner regulations for marijuana businesses. Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. Um, this is the process for adopting regulations, for reasonable regulations <coughs> for time, place, and manner for marijuana businesses. As you know, on the ballot, uh, we'll be asking Oregon City voters if marijuana businesses ought to be allowed in Oregon City. This provides a framework 
um, or certainty to know where and how those businesses will operate. Um, this process has started quite a while back, and since it started, we've had a lot of comments from public. We've had a series of open houses and planning commission hearings and city commission hearings, um, as well as online surveys, and had a lot of feedback to come up with this set of plans that we have. We've already done the first adoption, and so we're just recommending the second adoption. One thing to note that if it is a, if marijuana businesses is approved by Oregon City voters, then this ordinance does not go into effect until December 30th. Um, and then on January 1st, of course, the marijuana businesses would be allowed in the cities. Um, in the regulations, uh, there's a series of regulations regarding uh, distance between retail entities, so 1,000 feet. So just so you know, we would process those on a first come, first serve basis. So on the first day that we're open um, for business, when marijuana businesses are legal, that first business license application that we get will be the first in the door. So then we'll put the buffer of the 1,000 feet from that. And so that's how we would be administering the 1,000-foot buffer as those applications come in. Um, if there's no more questions, we just ask for the second reading. This is not a, pub a public hearing? Mm-mm. Okay. Is there any public comment? Seeing none. Well, uh, I'll make a comment. Well, I, it, you have to come up and okay. sit down so that the folks in the TV sure. land can can hear what you say. <laughs> Name and city of residence for the record, please. Jane Grimm, Oregon City. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not I'm not for or against necessarily this type of business. However, <clears throat> there's some concern in the community regarding homelessness and um, disadvantaged youth. So my thought is that <clears throat> if you have this type of business, would that not bring a lot of revenue to the city? And perhaps maybe offsetting some um, <clears throat> uh, citizens that perhaps don't want it in the city, you could offset this uh, a little bit by funding perhaps a warming house maybe a friendly house for children, a community center where kids can go be with each other, uh, do the computer, study, play basketball, this, this type of organization. <clears throat> so perhaps you can offset some of the, you know, if the voters say yes and there's still citizens that don't appreciate this, maybe we could, you know, kind of kill two birds with one stone here and and add some revenue to the city. Thank you. Good. Yeah, thank, thank you. Is there a motion? I move to approve second reading. Second. Moved by Commissioner Ride, second by Commissioner Smith. Ms. Richter. Ordinance number 16 1008, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City adopting time, place, and manner regulations for marijuana businesses, including medical marijuana processors and dispensaries, as well as recreational marijuana processors, dispensaries, producers, wholesalers, and retailers. Further discussion? Call a roll, please. Commissioner Shaw? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Ide? Aye. Commissioner Mangelberg? Aye. Mayor Holiday? Aye. Moving on, <laughs> 16588, ordinance number 16-1010, adopting a ban on outdoor cultivation of marijuana, Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. Um, so this is <coughs> for the second reading of uh, the banning of outdoor cultivation. So I wanted to just recap how we got here. Um, dovetailing with our last item regarding marijuana businesses, we started this conversation uh, quite a while ago about what the regulations ought to be regarding marijuana. And as a part of that, we heard a lot of comments about uh, personal cultivation outdoors. Now we know personal cultivation is not allowed for, uh, sorry, outdoor cultivation is not allowed for businesses. So really all we're talking about is personal cultivation. Um, we received a lot of comments. The Planning Commission did think about this issue quite a bit. Um, there was a discussion about outdoor cultivation being a nuisance 
and ultimately the Planning Commission forwarded a set of recommendations to you which included um, allowing outdoor cultivation. Then we had the August 17th City Commission hearing and there were some issues that were discussed. There were some concerns for the odor for outdoor cultivation, the tress trespassing and trespassing through neighbor's, neighbor's yards to get to yards where there was outdoor cultivation. There was a concern of theft and there was also a concern of visual exposure to kids as well. And so from that, um, staff was directed to come up with regulations uh, prohibiting outdoor cultivation. We had the first reading of that and um, this, with this we're asking for the second reading for banning outdoor cultivation. If you approve the second reading, um, it would be uh, effective s within 30 days. And if you do not approve the second reading, then the default is that you could have outdoor cultivation. Thank you. So before we <clears throat> move on to the public testimony piece, um, Ms. Richter, I, I assume everyone has seen the memo from Ms. Richter um, about the thoughts, yes, no? You haven't it's seen it? like a summary, we can do it. Yeah, yeah like if you can summarize yeah. um, the basic points, uh, emphasizing the fact that this would be the first time post House bill that someone has tried to do this. Okay. Um, so the most of the marijuana regulations that have happened recently relate to businesses and relate to regulating businesses. And you look at all of the recent measures and they talk about how we're going to regulate retailers and dispensaries and growers for commercial use, right? We didn't deal, nothing dealt with sort of personal use consumption uh, or growing for personal use. And they call this home grows. And um, the, so a couple of cities have prohibited outdoor growing for personal use. And um, there is a challenge right now in Grants Pass going on about that, about whether or not other rules, other statutes would prohibit local governments from regulating outdoor personal grows. Um, and in the 2016 legislature, the legislature adopted um, part of an, another sort of omni marijuana bill, includes a provision that says a city may not adopt an ordinance that prohibits or otherwise limits the privileges described in another section and that other section allows individuals to grow four plants. And so the, um, the pr it says, um, the production, processing, keeping, or storage of homegrown marijuana at a household by one or more persons 21 years of age and older, if the total of the homegrown marijuana at the household does not exceed four marijuana plants and eight ounces of usable marijuana at any given time. So that is the authorization to grow four plants for personal use. Um, and this provision of the 2016 House Bill 4014 says that a city may not limit that privilege. Unclear whether or not limit means you can, uh, you, we couldn't say you could have three plants, right. for example. Uh, we couldn't say you could have no plants, right? This is more along the lines of a time and manner restriction. You can have four plants, but you gotta have it inside. Um, the, the measure, just so you know, just for completeness, the measure also, the, the state law also provides that um, the homegrown marijuana cannot be readily seen by normal unaided vision from a public place. So if we do not pass this ordinance, the state law will provide that cannot be visible from a public place. So that's what you have as the background. Um, so, could you address the inside versus outside implications of this? Say that again. Um, does this interpretation, this background that you found, um, speak to whether it's inside or outside? No. no. <laughs> the the statute says local governments cannot limit the authorization for four plants does not say anything about, does limit mean 
any restriction or any any um, direction over how those four plants are grown? Or does limit mean you cannot get involved with four plants? I don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is I did a fair amount of research to try to find a local government that has adopted a prohibition post 2016 legislative section taking effect, which was June, and I haven't found one. So Pendleton, grants pass, both have them. They predate this ordinance, so they would have adopted an ordinance before this took effect, so maybe it wouldn't be implicated. Um, the the, the uh, outdoor prohibition in Medford is on the ballot for so, the voters to rule on. And, and that could still be overruled. Good. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the point that I was trying to get Ms. Richter to get to is, is that all of, the, all of the challenges that are being handled right now are pre the legislature and the governor signing off on the finalization of Measure 91. So this would be, we would be setting ourselves up to be the first ones to have someone challenge us on this. And my concern is that um, there are some very serious things over the next few years that we're going to need to spend money on as far as legal challenges or other things. And I'm not sure we want to set ourselves up as the test case on, on this. So, if I could, um, just, please. Um, I just wanted to point out. So I think there are three choices here. If I can sort of sum it up, if you're ready, um, we can adopt the ordinance as it's drafted um, to ban outdoor cultivation of marijuana for personal use. Second option would be to come back with an ordinance that restates state law. In other words, says cannot be viewed from a public place, which may do something in terms of letting people know that this is what the law is, um, because they may not be aware of this section 33 of House Bill 4014. Um, so that would be option two. Option three would be to consider whether or not there might be some way we could draft something to, instead of limiting the number of plants or being involved with the number of plants, but deal with odor. Somehow to craft some kind of an odor nuisance regulation. Again, I mean, we're sort of treading down the path of when we are limiting. And I don't know how far that goes, but we could work on that if that's something that the commission were interested in having us take a look at. So let me and I normally don't do this, but I want to guide the uh, or, or the fourth, guide, the, the fourth option the last would be three times. <laughs> the fourth option would be to ban the that's, that's not true. No. Yes, it is. Most of the time, I, I try to let you guys have you know your say first, but on this one, I think um, that it would be better for us to see if there's actually a problem before we try to provide a solution. So if we take a year, and, and to be honest, I think um, this has been going on for at least a year or two in the city, whether anybody wants to admit it or not. I know for a fact that I've had a, a medical grow within, you know, a few hundred feet of our house for several years, and I've never noticed anything. So my suggestion would be is we let this thing die tonight and we see if we have a, a real problem from a complaint driven situation just like we do with anything else in code enforcement and then we can come back and deal with it if we have a problem um, but I really don't want to set us up to spend a bunch of money in court trying to fight one of these organizations that's going to come out of the woodwork to challenge us if we do this so that's in essence a, a fourth option. Yeah, let it die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let yeah. It die. Um, so I, I think that, and a head nod from the audience. If if we're going down that road, do we need to hear from you folks? 
Okay. So I'll open up the discussion. If yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's 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 hear the public testimony then. So we'll go with uh, Ryan Lafreniere and Matthew Salser. Thanks for hearing me. My name is Matthew Sulzer, Oregon City. <clears throat> Marijuana has been demonstrated to provide medical benefits, helping reduce pain and inflammation, nausea, and seizures. Many people rely on it as an alternative to more costly, sometimes addictive, and potentially harmful or deadly pharmaceutical drugs. Marijuana is a non-toxic medicinal natural resource. Growing the plant outside is relatively inexpensive, requiring only good soil and possibly fertilizers and treatment for insects and fungal disease. Indoor growing requires expensive lighting and proper ventilation, costs which can be prohibitive to many who rely on the plant for its medicinal benefits and cannot afford products from dispensaries. Indoor space may also not be available to some who wish to exercise their legal right to cultivate. The aroma of a marijuana plant is strain dependent, ranging from a mild piney scent to a stronger skunky scent, which lacks the associated sulfur compounds that make actual skunk spray so noxious. This smell only appears as the plant produces the coveted buds at the end of its growth, lasting only a few weeks. The smell of an indoor grow may be even more potent when the heavily saturated air is vented outside. Even the most aromatic buds are no comparison to the stench of a ripe trash can, the exhaust of a truck, a fresh pile left by the neighbor's dog, or even a patch of blooming daisies. <laughs> <laughs> the smell near harvest time may attract thieves. Rather than theft of a plant from the yard, an indoor grow could motivate a burglary, leading to additional loss, property damage, or even possible injury or death of the residents. Someone stealing a plant from the yard warrants only a call to police, whereas an intruder in one's home may prompt the use of deadly force in defense of life. The smell may attract youth wanting a free high. It's understandable that parents not want marijuana easily accessible to their children, but it already is and has been for decades. Most kids can acquire it with just a call or a text to a friend. Marijuana is non-toxic, as opposed to the neurotoxin known as ethyl alcohol that can be found in many parents' refrigerators and liquor cabinets, or prescription drugs, which can easily be fatal. While marijuana use may not be advisable for the developing brain, outdoor cultivation of the plant introduces no new threat to the health of our children. In 2014, Oregon voters passed Measure 91, subsequently gaining the legal right to grow up to four plants per household, a step forward in recognizing our freedom. The logical place to grow a plant is in one's yard, and a marijuana plant presents no public hazard nor any nuisance comparable to those we already accept in our daily lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Lafreniere. Mr. Lafreniere, and oh, I'm from Oregon City. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys know my stance. Um, so just for the record, I don't grow. I have no interest in growing. I'm an arborist. I deal with plants daily. And the last thing I want to do is come home and deal with them some more. So that is not why I'm here. And that is not my interest. My interest is the violation of my property rights and telling me what I can and cannot grow on my property when I pay taxes to the city, when, um, you know, it's, it's just not right. And uh, that's my main point of argument here is that um, it, it, it's just it's not right and um, we're doing this on a what if basis you know what if the children come into our yards what if you know this happens and and there's a lot of what ifs in life and we can't look at that it like that we got to look at we're given we've given people the right by the state and that should be that and like the mayor says, it should be ended right now, right here, and there should be no more discussion on the violation of property rights and allowing police to now come into my backyard because a neighbor's unhappy and sees and smells something in my yard, and that that should never be a right. And there you go. Same thing I said last week, and the same thing I'll say at the next hearing, and the same thing I'll say at the next hearing after that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Paige Hurt and Jane Grimm. I'm 
So my name is Paige Hurt and I am a resident of Oregon City. I um, am here representing Oregon City Together, which, which is a local coalition that um, operates to reduce youth substance use. And so my primary concern is just around that access piece for our youth. Um, it's not around adult use um, or whether people choose to use or not use. And so when I was thinking about the outdoor um, cultivation and a ban or not to ban, what I looked at was some, uh, or tried to research was some information on what's happening in the other states. And what I found is Colorado, for example, just doesn't allow outdoor um, cultivation of marijuana, so it makes it really hard to kind of know um, what the access point is or how things have changed, particularly around youth use. Outdoor cultivation commercially or? For personal use. Personal for use. personal okay, use, thank yes. You. Um, so their law is marijuana plants must be kept um, in an enclosed locked area that can't be viewed openly. Um, in homes where there's youth under 21 years of age, um, it has to be locked and kept in a separate space that youth can't access. And I really appreciate that um, boundary and definition for our youth. Um, I, I understand that it is kind of a, you know, our rights versus, you know, personal use and, and all those things. Um, but I do believe that even though youth may be able to text, um, they may be able to get it from um, their friends or ad other adults who use, who don't have the good boundaries that probably most people do, um, I think that this will increase access to youth. And when you're talking about potentially you know, letting this die um, and seeing if we have a problem, my question would be, how do we measure that? Um, and being able to define that ahead of time. You know, is that because things increase with the police responses, things increase with the juvenile department? You know, how is that defined that it's a problem? Um, and I think sometimes once we kind of open that up, it's hard to reel it back in. And I think it's our responsibility as adults to take care of our youth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Grimm. Jane Grimm, Oregon City. Uh, this whole piece with the youth, especially the disadvantaged youth, is actually very near and dear to my heart. I was a foster parent for four years, and our youngest child actually is adopted through the DHS system. So it very much is very dear to my heart. I think the education, drug ed education, should come from the parents at home. Oftentimes, I'll sit on my porch at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. I live off Leland. It's a pretty heavily traveled road. Often, especially on the weekends, I will see, you know, 12 year olds, 13 year olds, or even younger children. <clears throat> so I get that there are parents out there who are not keeping an eye on their kid. That should not step on my rights as an Oregonian. We, yeah, everyone should parent their children. And the fact is, it doesn't happen. And yeah, there's a lot of disadvantaged youth out there. And I think one of the ways that we can help the disadvantaged youth is to open a friendly house type center, to, to reel in some of the opportunity that is in front of us instead of you know, taking a hard-nosed approach, oh, we don't want that in our city. We're, we're missing an opportunity to help the city with not only homelessness, but the disadvantaged youth and opening a, a little friendly house center where kids can go after school, get counseling. That's about all I have to say. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gott. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you all down for Halloween. Oh, different subject. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just on my mind night and day now. Um, I never found some of these yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. comments very interesting. I, I never even thought about the gentleman who was here who was talking about burglaries inside versus outside and the, the dangers of that. Um, what some of you don't know is I used to be a juvenile court counselor. That was my degree was in law enforcement and counseling and a degree in psychology. So I worked, I worked out at Donnelly Long Home um, um, for a while in Washington County. And I found that most of those kids, the problem wasn't so much the access to marijuana and things like that. It was pills in the family's homes, and it was alcohol. And uh, as minors, even I, I, I remember having, 
going to my dad's liquor cabinet and pouring out vodka and filling it back up with water so he'd never know. And I'd always mark the line so he'd never know. At 21, he gave me the bottle and said, this is pretty weak. You better start with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the main thing I wanted to talk about was as a planning commissioner, I, I did a little bit of work before we, we discussed it. And I went to Nancy Bush to ask her if there was anything in code. We already have something in code about nuisances, and that can be odors, and it can be barking dogs, it can be just about anything. So if we have an existing one, I think if someone does want to report something outdoor grow for a problem, if they report it, that's a way for us to watch those numbers. Uh, we know about, as I said, we know when barking dogs happen or abandoned cars. I think that if we let the existing code that we have for nuisances uh, be our guide for the future, that might be a, a good way to find out are we having a problem in the city with outside grows? I think we'll find that most people with larger lots, no one even knows that they're growing it because they don't s smell the odor. I, we talked about it on the Planning Commission that if you were in an apartment and you lived over a little uh, wall next to somebody, we didn't exactly like that. We thought of a setback, but then we finally, four to one, I think that was the vote, four to one. I, I think it was just, um, um, Denise said, uh, but uh, we decided to let the state law just stand as it was for what, what we passed on to you. So again, code enforcement already has something there for it, if, and we just can rely on that and take some numbers down the road. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else out there? Okay. So uh, is there a motion? Can I throw one thing at you, Mayor? Just, just. Well, you can make a comment. I don't would recommend you throw something at me. <laughs> just, you know, that there have been, there are, what we've been telling a lot of people have been calling is the commission is in the process of deciding this matter. We've had people calling about, I'm in my backyard. I don't like looking at my neighbor's backyard. So that, that isn't even seeing it from the public. That's my own backyard into somebody else's backyard. Uh, odor we've gotten uh, that's probably the thing we get the most mm -hmm. and there isn't anything uh, the nuisances are specific they're not just a general nuisance it's specific nuisances to, to noise and different things so there there are complaints we're just kind of telling everyone there's nothing we can do right now we're kind of waiting for that decision from the Commission so it's not it's not that we're not getting uh, feedback in the community it's that we're just kind of waiting for clear direction. Are, are you documenting that? Haven't been. Okay. Well, I think the first step is to start documenting that so we can see, you know, um, are we getting, you know, one call a month? Are we getting 25 calls a month? Uh, you know. I it, We just didn't think there'd be, you know, a, a need to start documenting those things. Sure. Um, but I just want you to know that that it, it is it is a conversation that that is going on up there mr shaw oh i'm sorry commissioner right. smith i didn't oh i'm not actually let's go to commissioner smith first please all right good since we're trying to follow our own rules <laughs> <laughs> trying um so the the testimony from the public both in the well the last several um, meetings has been very um, very important very um, good to hear um, different viewpoints and um, I think um, I feel fairly good about the um, decisions that we have made as a commission with the buffers around schools and and all the other things that we talked about Kanema neighborhood um, this issue I think um, is a little different. Um, talked about my um, concern about the commission in the past making decisions about people's property in terms of trees and other various things. Um, so that's definitely something we need to consider. Um, I think the question about whether or not limiting it inside or outside is a limit is an interesting question and and um, will obviously um, without any doubt end up in a in court um, not sure that that's the best process for us to go through um, I think that 
at least that conversation about where it's viewed from is a, is a good start to clarify that. Um, in, at least in, in the city. It doesn't, of course, take care of the individual neighbors. Um, I think it's far less likely for the neighbor to, to <laughs> climb over the fences and, and, and steal from their neighbor. But, um, you know, in the nuisance ordinance, I don't know what that really, you know, how much our current nuisance ordinance would really address that. Um, so I'd kind of like to look at that, I guess, a little bit. But um, I'm not necessarily leaning for option four, let it die. But I'm also um, kind of, I'm, I'm definitely in the middle in terms of, um, um, you know, trying to clarify it, clarify it in a way that we make sure that the citizens understand that if you have it in your yard, it needs to be away from <coughs> public view. Um, but I don't know that we really need to, to limit what the state is asking. Um, and so I don't, I don't think going there is a, is a smart idea. I think we've made some really good decisions on all the other topics um, with this, and so I think that is actually outweighing a lot of the problems that I think OC together and a lot of us really have major concerns about. We're also going to be talking about another one on the agenda tonight that would also do even more. Probably not. Much. With smoking. Commissioner Shaw. So, as you uh, remember, I'm kind of always on the, the kid's side of this. So I appreciated Ms. Hurt's uh, testimony here tonight. And um, <laughs> one thing I've learned up here is that I have to keep remembering that I'm a uh, elected person here. And I'm, even though I have these personal issues here, <laughs> And yep. then I go out in the community and I try to address these and come to find out I'm still just in the minority on this, you know. So um, this is a tough one for me because I, like I say, I'm, uh, I, you know, if it was going to have to be grown uh, privately, then I would, I guess I'd rather see it outside than inside where all of the uh, nuisances that this can cause I'd rather see it on an in outside venue than inside where the children are and um, but I agree with Commissioner Smith if there's some way to if we're gonna have it outside if there's some way to make sure there's some kind of a containment I think that's what you were saying is that correct I didn't say that but uh, I thought that's what you were Getting just, there too. Well, the state doesn't say that. I was saying whatever the state says is oh. in, in terms of what our, our assistant attorney told us um, a minute ago, which was so this, from within this right, yeah, visible from that. public. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I uh, I'm still kind of torn on this, uh, but I'm interested to hear what other folks have to say here, Commissioner Megaberg. So I was originally um, strongly in favor of having it be indoors and not outdoors, but I certainly don't want to be a test court case. And um, we've heard a lot of testimony from the public. Most of it has been in favor of outdoor grows, and we need, I'd, I'd like to respect that. And so at this point, uh, and also the Planning Commission recommendation to allow outdoor growing. So. At this point, I'd like to let the state law stand and, and let go of the idea of forcing it indoors. Commissioner Ide. You just took the words right out of my mouth, um, <laughs> pretty much. Um, I also am not eager to invite a lawsuit, um, nor willing to act uh, to prohibit the outdoor growing, um, especially when the state has ruled as it has. Um, I'm, I am a strong, uh, advocate of property rights just like you are sir and um, I but as a former employee who did a lot of the risk management for the city I saw those lawsuits come in and I um, I just would anticipate that one would come and I just want to avoid that if at all possible so that's that's partly my reasoning as well okay so um, 
I think what I'm hearing is that, uh, and feel free to jump on me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> that we leave this for the time being and um, let's collect some data over the next year about you know complaints and other kinds of issues and then we could revisit it say at the end of next summer after um, you know we, we have some actual data on complaints and other kinds of issues that might come up does that seem reasonable we may want to address the nuisance area too that how we strengthen that to include the outdoor growth well, my, 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 my question there is, is that if, if we go down that road of smell, where, where do we draw the line? You know, do, do we draw the line at roses or at bougainvillea or, you know, other things? I mean, you know, there are, I, I visited with uh, Canby's uh, Chamber of Commerce director is a master gardener. And he provided me with a list of a dozen very f fragrant, pungent plants. So uh, I is it possible for us to say marijuana can't smell, but another plant can? Um, I think that's a, you know, I, I think you're going down the same road that we, and, and I understand Commissioner Smith's um, frustration with the mural thing, but it's the same thing. If we, yeah. can't, if we can't control it's content, right. then, you know, th there's a problem there. So. Mm -hmm. I'm saying let's let's take a year and go through next summer. Let's see if we have, you know, issues with theft or with, you know, a, a, a massive number of complaints about smell and other things. And then we can take another look at this if we need to. Maybe we should wait until after the harvest to see mm -hmm. what well, the I level said, of complaints Well, that's why I said are. after next summer. <laughs> Isn't the harvest in the fall? No. Well, okay. <laughs> a year from now, roughly. Yeah. Generally speaking, what comes after summer? Fall. Is it, so do I have a head nod here? Are we okay with that? Then we're going to move on. I'm okay with that. Um, so we're at 16.574, first reading of ordinance 16-1011, amendment of Oregon City Municipal Code Chapter 12.16 to include a new section 12.16.070, park exclusions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. I got stuck there for a second. Go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Lewis. Yes. Uh, as you were, uh, we brought this ordinance to the um, work session on October 11th. Uh, this uh, language was put together after um, noticing that we had high rates of repeat offenders in Oregon City Parks. Uh, this was done in partnership with uh, parks district or parks uh, department staff, um, Oregon City Police, uh, court staff, and the city attorney's office. Uh, it went through the uh, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee and was sent uh, to the city commission uh, from their September 22nd meeting. And we discussed it again on the October 11th meeting um, for the city commission work session. Um, a couple of highlights of the exclusion ordinance. Again, it is only for um, officers. Uh, so municipal police officers will have the opportunity to exclude individuals who are uh, participating in behavior in parks uh, that is of um, in nature that is not accepted in, in parks. The exclusion, again, um, will be um, done only after the offender is offered the opportunity to stop that offense and then it will go into a, a 30 day 90 day and then 180 day uh, for each subsequent offense so first time offender being excluded 30 days uh, second time 90 third time 180 days uh, they will have an opportunity to appeal uh, through the court system as well as being offered the opportunity to uh, ask for a waiver in part or in full from the city manager's office. And at that, I will uh, offer up questions. Uh, is there any public testimony? Seeing none, Commissioner Magward? A uh, question, where else in Oregon City is smoking banned? No, we're not talking about smoking, this is park exclusions. Smoking's oh. the next one. Okay, 
Sorry. Any other? Nope. Uh, I'd entertain a motion. I'll move for uh, first reading of ordinance number 16-1011. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by Commissioner Smith. Ms. Richter. Ordinance number 161011, an ordinance of the City of Oregon City amending the Oregon City Municipal Code creating section 12.16.070 to allow for exclusion of individuals from Oregon City Parks. For the discussion, call roll please. Commissioner Shaw? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Ide? Aye. Commissioner Mangelberg? Aye. Mayor Holiday? Aye. So, uh, 16589, first reading of ordinance number 16 1012, demand the use of tobacco in Oregon City Public Parks. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will make it short, I, I promise. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> it worked. So there, there were some questions that came up, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. There were some questions that came up uh, during the work session, and I wanted to make sure that I was thorough in my explanation and uh, background in the um, Tobacco Free Parks uh, Ordinance and look at um, other jurisdictions that similarly, that have similar language ordinances uh, uh, users from um, using tobacco products on uh, parks and recreation facilities. Um. Oh. Okay. Well, it. Do I need to do no, anything on? Oh, okay. Um, so a little background, uh, history of the ordinance. Again, this was initiated through the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. So uh, members of the public who volunteer their time uh, to uh, direct staff and lead um, kind of discussion pieces on uh, directions of city business. Uh, we did uh, at the PRAC meetings in March, April, May, and June of 2016 discuss the Tobacco Free Parks Ordinance and then passed on to uh, City Commission, which we discussed at the October 11th work session. Uh, the ordinance language, again, <coughs> includes uh, tobacco, um, there we go, includes uh, tobacco products, uh, cigarettes, uh, e-cigarettes, uh, nicotine devices, um, includes uh, snuff dip, um, tobacco as, as a whole, as you see there in the ordinance language. Um, why tobacco free park? So I did have uh, some conversations with the uh, county uh, smoke um, tobacco, uh, tobacco prevention coordinator and uh, got some information from him in regards to um, why, uh, why a city would want to go to offering tobacco free parks. Uh, so you'll see there again uh, for uh, the health benefits, uh, secondhand smoke. Um, they did say that uh, no level of secondhand smoke is risk-free, uh, contains many chemicals that we're all aware of. Um, even exposure in outdoor areas uh, can be close to the exposure <coughs> levels in interior areas. Um, environmental benefits, so both from a litter perspective as well as from preventing um, being damaging to, to wildlife, pets, and children. Uh, fire risk benefits. Uh, one in 10 fires in Oregon has started uh, cigarette use. And we often, you might find something like this happening near bark mulch or trash receptacles. Uh, there are more than a thousand park systems across the nation that have passed similar initiatives, including locally, um, many of our neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, nationally, you see the list of the, the national uh, either cities or park uh, districts that offer uh, smoke-free parks and tobacco-free parks. Uh, our neighboring uh, North Clackamas Park District conducted a tobacco survey for their 2012 system master plan. Uh, during that survey, 78% uh, <coughs> of respondents were supportive of a tobacco-free <coughs> policy and 89% were neutral or supportive of a tobacco-free policy. 
Um, and as far as a communication strategy and enforcement, again, like we discussed during the work session, a lot of it would be self-enforced or peer-enforced. Uh, we'd make sure that we have clear, positive signage. Uh, County Public Health has offered to help uh, pay for signage as well. So that's a partnership piece that we have. Um, consistent messaging, um, we'd make sure that we have that with our uh, partner organizations, including sports leagues and events. And then uh, again, violations would be handled as with any of our park ordinances, uh, park rules and regulations that we ask folks to, to do or not do when they're in one of our parks. So at that, I will um, open it up to, to any questions. motion uh, move to approve uh, first reading ordinance number 16-1012 second moved by Commissioner Shaw second by Commissioner Manberg is it further discussion Ms. Um, oh. sorry yeah I do have one comment um, so in the ordinance it, it talks about um, mm. the definition of used tobacco and in under that definition includes um, marijuana and smoking but the second uh, let's see <coughs> so smoking marijuana is in that definition in the ordinance of using tobacco my question comes to the end of that section 11 where it then goes on to um, in addition, used tobacco shall mean ingest or place within the mouth or nose any type of tobacco product, including chewing tobacco, uh, snooze, snuff, or dip. Um, so my question was, this includes smoking marijuana. It does not include um, edibles. And so my question was... Um, which, um, so my question was, you know, did that fall under the drinking? You know, we look at the ordinance um, that talks about drinking in city parks. What else does that cover in terms of drug use? You're asking me? Asking yeah, somebody. well, I mean, it, <laughs> and, and to what I just heard in the audience, it's not tobacco, but it is tobacco in this ordinance, up in all the rest of this ordinance. It's listed as using tobacco. That it's follows under that definition. Smoking, smoking any tobacco, any toba smoking any tobacco or cannabis product right. or weed or other plant capable of being smoked. <clears throat> but then it goes on right. to say, in addition to use tobacco, shall mean to ingest or place within one's mouth or nose any type of tobacco product. I think we could, if uh, Commissioner Smith wishes the commission the commission's discretion any type of tobacco or cannabis product in yep. that last sentence would um, work to prohibit uh, edibles I the only other thing I want to point out about this if you look at the sort of um, preamble to this ordinance it talks about the hazards of secondhand smoke um, and the health hazards associated with secondhand smoke. I'm not sure you have that with the crumbs from edibles. Um, I mean, you know, maybe you do, but it, if we do but go you down, say if the we same for tobacco. No, I know, I, I, I know you're right, but so I'm, I'm just, just saying. All consistent. I'm saying is, if you do want to go and change this to add cannabis product, I might want to add another preamble provision that talks about the health hazards associated with. So, so if, if I want to go crazily down this road, does that mean that you can't wear a nicotine patch and be in a park or chew nicotine gum? <laughs> um, not according, well, what is Yeah, that? yeah. <laughs> that seems like something I would have brought up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Let me gosh. read this again. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I well, here's my here's my reason for being out. It needs it should be consistent through through that definition. I think. Um, I agree. And the other point I would make is, um, how can we say that it's okay to use 
uh, a marijuana product in a city park when we won't even allow anyone to sell it within a buffer that we've created as a city commission. So it, that's not something we can we can do either. I understand. So we've created buffers around city if, parks if, for people. If you wish to testify, then please fill out a form, give it to Katie Riggs, and we because I can't have a conversation with the audience because they only hear me, they don't hear you. So in order to be fair to the people who aren't here but do watch on TV, and I'm amazed at the number of people that do, um, we need to keep those procedures. So if you'd like to, to testify, I, I'm more than happy to have you come up. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Are you done? That was it. Is there anybody else? Commissioner Shaw. <clears throat> well, I think the big picture is, um, and I've probably said this before, that we've spent millions of dollars, a lot of time educating not only us, but our children and everybody else, that smoking is bad, period. You know, cigarettes, whatever. So this kind of uh, goes along with that philosophy. Because, um, you know, parks, we're trying to create a family friendly atmosphere here, Mr. Lewis is saying. So, um, and uh, kids see b behavior and think that that's okay, you know, so because when they see it. But so once again, um, I do have to, uh, I agree with our uh, ordinance here as it, as it is, so. Commissioner Ide. Um, I just have a question of staff. I, don't, I think I came into this kind of late here, but um, I, have there, well, have there been a lot of complaints about smoking in the parks and um, or where, where did this kind of come from? Was it the concern with the marijuana or I just kind of would like to know if there have been a lot of complaints mostly. Um, I, honestly, I couldn't answer that that yeah, question. Yeah, you're kind as of far as the in. number. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm I'm unaware of the number of uh, complaints. That's not something that we track or something that's that I have asked of of staff. Uh, the ordinance was um, again brought forth during the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, so it was the public that brought mm -hmm. it forth for staff to consider and bring forward to to commission. Right. Um, I, I would say that in discussions that we've had with staff, it, it is uh, prevalent in, in parks that people are, are smoking. Um, and to, to what extent it's a nuisance for people uh, that they would prefer not to be around somebody that's smoking but not file a complaint officially, knowing that it's not currently against rules or regulations, mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I couldn't really answer. Okay, I I just feel uh, I we're kind of going down a path that I don't know if we want to do that. You know, when I start looking at reading the changes in the ordinance and you know just the comments that I've heard up here about you know the the different types of tobacco products and all of these things, I and taking away the rights of people to um, to smoke in public, you know, or or, or smoke outside, I should say. Um, you know, I I understand about being in a building, being in a restaurant, inside buildings, um, but there seems to be much more of a respect for the staying 10 feet or 25 feet away from buildings, and people seem to be doing pretty good at that from what I can see. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be supporting the ordinance just because I just don't think that um, we need to be restricting folks from smoking in parks, I think. So, um, sorry to interrupt the commission here, but I do have one public person. Mr. Mitchell, would you come up? Thank you. I'm Mike Mitchell, Oregon City, and I am a member of PRAC, so if I can give me maybe a little background on, on what happened. And I'll be perfectly honest. I don't know whether the first mention was made by a PRAC member or whether it was public comment. Uh, but on more than one occasion, we did have members of the public take their time and come to a PRAC meeting, which is a fairly rare occurrence, um, to discuss, uh, request a ban on smoking uh, in our parks. 
So that's what started the discussion with PRAC. We looked at, uh, as Mr. Lewis mentioned, we looked at what other cities had done. Uh, it appeared that that was the trend, that more and more were going that way. Um, we started, I would say that we had a unanimous agreement when we started talking about banning smoking. And then we had a little bit more of a difference of opinion when you start going down some of these rabbit holes about vaping or uh, chewing tobacco products. And we did not get into marijuana edibles at all. Rocky, you got a new one on us there. <laughs> we didn't think about that one. Um, but that's, that's basically how it, how it started. It was... Um, it was public comment, um, but I suppose to be fair, people that are smoking in the parks didn't come to the PRAC meeting and say, please protect my right to smoke in the park either. So there's the other so side of that. So it wasn't a large crowd of people. It was just, no. you know, like one or two people came. came yes. Forward. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we'll continue on. Commissioner Mangerberg. Um, i re ask my question that I asked earlier, where else in the city is smoking banned? We have a ban on, uh, on some of the campuses, including the City Hall campus. Um, I believe we have one at Pioneer Center. Um, I would have to go back to get a complete, complete list. I don't remember all the facilities off the top of my head, but primarily around our, this campus, um, you know, so with outside as well as inside. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. All right. So my last comments um, were followed by many, well, several city commissioner <coughs> comments that didn't even answer the questions that I asked. So here's where we're at right now. Commissioner Shaw supports it as written, which means he says that you, you agree that you, can, you can't smoke a marijuana, you can't smoke a joint in the city park, but you can do anything else with any marijuana products you can consume, et cetera. Commissioner Ide, who um, I think supported buffers around parks for selling marijuana anywhere near a park, but yet you can, you're more than okay with someone smoking. Uh, no, it's, a, it's, a it's already illegal park. to smoke marijuana in public anyway. Under well, the state law, correct? I'm just saying, in that ordinance, it specifies that she's not, she's not agreeing with the ordinance. The Oregon ordinance specifically calls out, in this ordinance, smoking marijuana. And she is not supporting this ordinance. So I'm just pointing that out. It's kind of a contradiction. Okay. Um, so I guess I want to hear the commissioner's actual input on the two comments that I had. One, should it be consistent with smoking and other marijuana products? Um, obviously, um, this is, I think, similar to drinking in, in a city park, um, which is also not allowed. Um, and then the other question, um, which is, um, well, the question about, um, where was I going? So the question about the edibles and then the question about um, just making sure this was all consistent it, um, from the top part in, the, in terms of the definitions. Okay. Um, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I, I try to look at this job as to do as little as possible to restrict the public's rights and freedoms while maintaining order and discipline inside the city. Um, I don't think it's our job to perform social engineering at a city level. Uh, so I haven't supported this thing from day one. Uh, I, I, again, I think it's a problem in search of a solution or a solution in search of a problem. Um, the whole thing about marijuana, and I, and I get where Commissioner Smith is coming from, you know, consistency is important. Um, the, the state law has consumption of marijuana um, pretty well covered. And to be honest, if you put cannabis in a sucker, 
you can't tell if it's a regular sucker or a sugar-free sucker or a cannabis sucker. Nor can you tell if you put beer in a Coke can. Absolutely. But and I guarantee our, it's still in our city ordinances. And, and, it, and it's illegal, but it happens all the time. Um, there is drinking in our city parks all the time. And until it becomes a problem whereby the police are called, generally speaking, it's not a problem. Right, but those are in our ordinance. I'm just asking, should this be in the ordinance? Well, and, I, what, be, and if and, we're going to be consistent, and, and I'm with, it should be. I'm with Commissioner Ride. Right. I don't think it should be in ordinance at all. So, um, uh, Commissioner Shaw. So, uh, a little bit for Commissioner Smith. Um, I am in favor of this ordinance the way it is, and then would like to, and then if. If we see edibles and other things start developing, we can address those later. But for now, this um, is uh, what I think is the correct way to go. As far as uh, consistency, I'm just not sure where you're coming from on that. What, 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 what is the incon inconsistency? This ordinance talks about use of tobacco. It lists yes. every possible use of tobacco. Correct. It also mentions smoking marijuana but it doesn't it's not consistent in showing all of the different products that would be under that definition that's all i'm saying so it's not consistent with you know in with use of tobacco it's listing all of these different things okay so the bottom part is not consistent with that it's only saying if you smoke marijuana and so what we're saying um that this ordinance does not cover someone doing anything else, um, have, ingesting any marijuana product in a city park when we've already said you can't even buy it within a certain buffer of the park. But now we're going to say it's okay um, to not call that out in this ordinance. I think it's crazy. So, but that's what this commission wants to do. Then I think the public should question that. I think it's it's not consistent with what we've already said. But um, do, we, do we have to restate state law in a city ordinance when it's already illegal to smoke marijuana in any public place in the entire state? Then why is it listed in here? Well, then it at shouldn't all? be listed in there. I I asked the question. I didn't say what we were going to vote. That's up to you guys. No, to I, and it. I was just. I, uh, so I guess hang on. You don't even once, follow the policy anyway. So what is? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on one second. So, Mr. Gow, I'm not going to allow you to testify. Um, and and I, I allowed Mr. Mitchell to come up because he was on the Planning Commission and had an idea what he was going to talk about. But I generally don't want to get in the idea of having a back and forth discussion between the public and the commission. I just wanted to read it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Megabert. I think the point of the ordinance is to address the perceived nuisance and um, litter problems and secondhand smoke impacts that some people find objectionable and so the edible side unless people are leaving wrappers around is not a nuisance in my mind as chew spit on grass would be considered a nuisance and a maintenance problem for staff so i don't see the need to add edibles to the list for that reason. Okay. Um, and uh, I actually punched my own button. So uh, by the same token, I think all of those other, quote, tobacco product things, you know, shouldn't be on the list. Um, you know, chewing tobacco, I mean, people spit in the park one way or the other, right? Um, the likelihood of killing enough grass to make it a maintenance issue is is pretty slim. Um, you know, snus and the other things. I, I you know, I, I I just think if you're going to do that, you know, it needs to be as non-limiting as possible, and you have to stick with what you're trying to do. I'm not going to support it in any case, but you know, I get the secondhand smoke thing. I get the littering thing with cigarettes. The rest of that seems to me to just be people saying I don't like tobacco therefore we're gonna do the best we can to tell somebody else what they can or can't do and I'm sorry uh, that that goes against the fundamental freedoms that we celebrate in this country 
Is there anybody else? Is there a motion? There was already Four. a motion and a second. And a second. Uh, any further discussion? Call roll, please. Uh, after the first reading. Oh, first reading. Sorry. Sorry, Ms. Richter. Go ahead. Ordinance number 16-1012, an ordinance amending section 12.16.020 of the Oregon City Municipal Code to ban the use of tobacco in public parks within Oregon City Parks. Commissioner Shaw? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Ide? Nay. Commissioner Mengelberg? Aye. Mayor Holiday? No. Okay. Anybody have anything to pull off the consent agenda? Nope. Then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Call roll, please. Commissioner Shaw? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Ide? Aye. Commissioner Mangelberg? Aye. Mayor Holliday? Aye. Uh, Mr. Manager, communications? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Evening, Commissioners. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. L John Lewis with some uh, updates on uh, the grant applications. So thank you for um, uh, just a couple minutes here on the um, Metro Avenue completion project so this is the Mala last avenue <laughs> what did i say metro, metro avenue you got, <laughs> sorry you got metro on the brain uh, yeah i do have metro on the brain it's a metro grant that we're pursuing and our project is the malala avenue completion project so it's the pretty much the final completion of malala avenue it's a project that we've estimated at uh, eight million dollars and we're asking for just under four million dollars in grant funding and we just wanted to mention it yet again. We've been floating lots of uh, social media announcements about this project. We're actually soliciting public comment through um, Metro's public forum that they use. They've got an online survey, real simple, very simple to do, and just takes a few minutes. Public comments, I think, do matter. Um, and um, so just directing you to that. We're gonna be doing some other things with regard to presentation to the C4 and uh, trying to um, keep our ranking in, in, in funded status. Right now our project ranks sixth out of 27 projects and um, we think it's a, a good project but there's other projects out there that others like too. So um, I know uh, Mayor Holiday and Commissioner Mangelberg attended the C4 Metro Subcommittee this morning. We had a heated discussion about uh, whether I guess it was about whether or not the criteria that Metro set really matters or if we should look at some other kind of criteria. But um, so if you remember three years ago, play back to three years, we had a little dog and pony show at the County um, Development Services Building in their public meeting and they've asked us to do something similar this year. And so um, that will be on November 3rd at 645 and we're probably gonna ask folks to rally around our project again. And that combined with some planned speakers. Um, so just wanted to mention that and just let you know that um, our project, once again, scored really well. So it's, it's really kind of up to um, what the political leadership across the county thinks. So with that, I'll end. Uh, an update from Chief Ben. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, so going back to, if you remember the radio project, the C-800 radio project that got approved at the last mm -hmm. ballot, and just kind of a quick reminder, there's the what C-800 is, is we all um, have one seat, every city, every user of C-800. So CECOM, you hear me use that acronym sometimes, that is uh, the group that's the dispatchers and who you call and the ones who um, dispatch our, uh, our police officers and fire. C-800 is basically the infrastructure that they're calling on, all the radio towers and that sort of stuff. It's almost the same member board, but a different, uh, a different function. So with the passage of that, one of the things that came up is, obviously there's a lot of money that's gonna be spent, and we're in the process of how are we gonna go about spending that. There was an open letter that uh, Kim Yamashita, who's the chief of the Sandy Police Department, sent uh, to the board, also to some electeds. I don't know if you have heard about this, but essentially what, what her concern was, was she disagrees with how we were doing this and uh, specifically saying that this sole procurement idea that we, the road that we were going down, that she thinks it's a problem. And one of the 
key reason she stated was something that happened in the state of Washington. They did a sole procurement of a uh, project that was statewide up there. And it was a, it was a mess, uh, a lot of cost overruns, and, and there were some different things that she had quoted uh, a study afterwards, kind of a, a debrief of what had happened. Uh, so kind of, I, I, I researched that to see what, are we making the same uh, mistake? I, I think she's uh, got great intentions bringing this up, making sure everybody's doing the right thing. Uh, there are some differences, though, that I just want you to know in, if and when you find out about this from, from what happened in Washington State and what that uh, letter that's out there uh, is uh, calling attention to in our, our project. That Washington State, first off, it was a, a statewide radio system, so there were a bunch of things that came up, engineering <coughs> things that they did not foresee that caught caused huge cost overruns about uh, coverage areas and uh, <coughs> um, what th there are several things that make our project completely different than this one there was a company uh, so so who who tells us what do we need and and who said what this very expensive project uh, uh, does does Motorola the vendor tell us what we need to spend or to somebody else well there was a, uh, a company called IXP, completely separate from Motorola, an outside vendor. Uh, Portland, or yeah, essentially um, all three counties in the Portland metro area paid over a million dollars for this needs assessment. So this group said, look, this is what you need. Um, Portland, Salem, Clark County all went through uh, full RFP process and ended up choosing Motorola for their projects. Uh, Washington County is getting ready to do this, the same thing that we are, and uh, they are also going with Motorola. Um, we have gotten from Motorola, they're going to demonstrate at numerous places through our process that the same pricing that all these other agencies got, that we're going to be getting the same or better price uh, uh, or better pr uh, pricing. If not, if, if at any point we're not guaranteed that we're going to get that, then we'll go out for a full RFP process. Uh, another thing that's different that I don't think Washington did built into our program is uh, citizen oversight. So at several steps as we're going through this process, we're going to have people watching everything that we're doing, making sure that there's not going to be a bunch of uh, cost overruns. And in terms of Motorola, it, it is very important in the Portland metro area even down uh, to Salem, Marion County, and up into Clark County, that we have interoperability, uh, that we can communicate with them, because uh, a lot of times we're going and helping each other. So, if you have any questions about that, let me know now or at any time down the road. Uh, let me let me just say that um, this happens to be something I'm intimately familiar with, having background in uh, low voltage uh, electronics and and stuff like that, and uh, you know, worldwide it's difficult to find a vendor as reliable and as consistent as Motorola. Um, if you think back to the era of the first cell phones, uh, those were Motorola cell phones. And, you know, I, I dropped my Motorola flip phone off the top of a roof more than once and went down, popped the battery back on, and it worked fine. Um, I understand the hesitation about sole source contracts sometimes. Um, but when you have a company that has as long a history of, of quality and, and engineering inside the field of radio communications, um, you just don't see it much. You know, I mean, there, there really isn't even a close second to Motorola. And I would be very hesitant to be using, you know, going out for an RFP and, and you know, you run into, you know, Acme radio systems, um, you know, I'd be way more hesitant than that than, get, than going with Motorola. So I'm, I, I think I'm fine. And if we're talking about, you know, we already have systems out there, whether it's Salem or Portland, that's already using a system. Um, when we think back to the Clackamas Town Center shooting or even the recent situation we had in Oregon City just a couple of weeks ago where we had agencies from Westland and Gladstone and Clackamas County all coming to help us or uh, I was actually working in Salem uh, on the day that the Town Center shooting and I saw 60 different cars go by me on the freeway as I was driving to work. So it's important that the most important thing in any kind of an emergency situation is communication. And so if we 
communication between the agencies is paramount. And I, I get that maybe somebody's unhappy about something, but you got a board. Um, you guys all talked about this, right? So, you know, every once in a while there's an outlier out there, but and and I'm sure that uh, that Sandy's chief has you know good motivations, but I'm I'm totally satisfied with the decision that you guys make as professionals. Commissioner Megenberg, I have a related comment. This has come up in Canby as well. Fully support the the intent, but these towers are big, and they because they have to be seismically strong. They need to be lattice towers, and because of county's uh, land use regulations, they have to go within cities first. They need to demonstrate that they've exhausted all possibilities before they can go out in the rural areas. So it's very likely we're going to get one or two or more in Oregon City, and they're big, and some people think they're ugly. So just wanted to pass that along. Well, I'm a neighbor. <laughs> of one of those towers I look out my living room window and see the tower at Mountain View um, and it's one of those things that uh, that we put up with that we deal with for having the ability to protect each other um, you know so I, I think that's just the way it is and um, Commissioner Shaw I was gonna suggest to uh, Chief Band, that uh, when you develop this oversight committee, that you um, ask uh, Library Director Cole to be on that because she's known to be on time and on budget. So I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll take that as a directive. Okay. Won't we? That's right. We've got she gets great updates. <laughs> And she has all this free time now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> would you like me to move on? I, I would I'd like okay. to move on, actually. That's and right. don't tell That's me right. we have an update from the library director. I was going to put it to a vote in a little bit. <laughs> um, just a couple, a couple of quick reminders. Saturday, October 29th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., kids pumpkin decorating carving contest at the Holding Cell at the Caulfield House, followed by on Monday, October 31st, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., uh, trick-or-treat on Main Street. So hopefully everybody has a chance to come down um, and uh, enjoy those festivities. Uh, Clackamas Cities Association dinner is October Tuesday, October 25th, beginning at 530 at the Pioneer Center. It's $40 to attend. Uh, we are hosting it this year uh, or this, this time around, and uh, Library Director Cole will be talking about the library uh, expansion, the Carnegie uh, renovation and that process, and then giving a tour uh, of the facility for those uh, attending the dinner um, as well. And so then we're doing that at the library? We are having the dinner at the Pioneer Center with a presentation, and then we'll be going over for a tour of the facility oh, okay. after that. All right. Okay. And just confirming that it sounded like at our last meeting, because the work session on November 8th is the night of the election, we we're going to cancel that work session. We are proposing, we do have a couple items that we want to bring before you. We're going to proposing to hold work sessions before the November 2nd regular city commission meeting as well as before the November 16th. So yeah. I'll just give you an update on that. So that does conclude my presentations for tonight. Uh, so going back to, oh, never mind. I can't think of it now. Go ahead. So who wants to go first? Commissioner Megerberg? Um, sure. I attended the MPAC meeting last week, and um, it was pretty well attended. I'm um, trying to think what the main topics were. Um, Oh, they had a presentation on um, food food scraps and how that might be processed within the Portland metro area and how big of an impact it has on the waste stream. And they're going to be doing a concerted effort to um, handle more of it. And because of odor concerns, they're looking at um, in, uh, burning it or having it be contained, anaerobic digestion, I guess. So um, more to come on that, but there's going to be a big push toward, uh, especially restaurants and hospitals and um, universities, that kind of thing, capturing food waste um, before it hits the waste stream and converting that into energy. And um, so more to come on that. It was a pretty interesting conversation. Um, then I uh, went to the Metro C4 committee. Um, Mr. Lewis has already reported on that. I'm definitely advocating for our McLaughlin project. 
um, along with other commissioners, attended the library opening, which was great. Congratulations to Library Director Cole for a job well done on that. That's it. Mr. Shaw. So, I um, attended another ribbon cutting, and this is for the Windermere Real Estate Office, uh, which is just across kind of catty corner up the street from the Dairy Queen now. <laughs> Uh, and went to the uh, Clackamas County Business um, OC, uh, CCBA, and, um, which is held at 7.30 on a Wednesday morning in Lake Oswego. So, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah I know. Um, but it's interesting to go there uh, because you do get uh, some input from other cities that, that go and uh, see what else is going on in the other cities. But... It's also good there to uh, because it kind of keeps the uh, county banter down a little bit, so they don't pick on Oregon City when there's somebody there. So I'm doing that for us, you know. Taking so. one for the team. Yeah, <laughs> taking one for the team. Anyway, um, and then went to the uh, Canby Library Grand Opening, as was Commissioner Miltenberg there. So, but I didn't get a tour yet. So of your new arranged. office, you know. So. Uh, and then right after that was the uh, Oregon City Library grand opening, and I think we've all noted what a wonderful gem that is for us now. So, uh, and then went to Park Place uh, Neighborhood Association meeting Monday night. That's it. Um, just the library um, events. That's it. Okay. Right. Um, just. Also attended Park Place, um, a lot of people. There were probably 60 people there, maybe. It was great. Um, went to the Optimist Club installation last night. That was amazing to see all the support uh, for uh, Optimist, the friend of youth. And all of the, um, the, the support that we offer financially to, uh, for, for children's and youth services in the city. It's just great. Um, loved the, uh, the library opening. It was um, just spectacular. And mm -hmm. the, the, the time capsule and all the history that's going in there, I just thought that I was just, it made me jump up and down. I was so excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I also um, attended the downtown Oregon City um, board meeting uh, last week. And I'm kind of in a learning stage about learning all of those, uh, what they're all about. Um, and I'm hoping to be appointed to that very soon. That's it. So do I need to do anything other than just appoint Commissioner Ide to the Downtown Oregon City Board? Nope. That's it. Done. I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Would you like a more thorough process? <laughs> no, that'll do. <laughs> that'll do. Uh, she called me uh, a week or two ago and asked me uh, to to be on the board and I said I was more than happy to, to make that happen. Um, I think it's good for us to have a city commissioner on that board. Um, I'm thrilled that uh, former Commissioner Polly is still uh, serving in that capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have uh, two very smart, strong women um, representing yeah. us down there. Uh, I've had a pretty light couple of weeks, actually. Um, I did attend the C4 subcommittee meeting this morning. Um, as usual, there is a difference of opinion between the county commission and the metro cities about how things should operate. Um, and going forward, we'll find a way to, to make that work out. Um, I will note that uh, folks should be receiving their ballots in the mail anytime in the next few days. Um, please take the time to read your voters pamphlet statements, do whatever research you need and vote. Um, I will be coming out with a, uh, a letter uh, in the next couple of days um, to the Pamplin Media and the Oregonian um, about what I feel about local issues, uh, stuff that affects Oregon City. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anything beyond, um, beyond what I really feel affects Oregon City directly, so don't expect me to make a presidential pick or anything like that. But <laughs> I, I do think there's, there are five or six very important things on the ballot that, that directly affect Oregon City, and I, I will be offering my uh, opinion and how I'm going to, to vote on those issues. Uh, beyond that, 
Um, I think everything's moving in the right direction. Uh, I, can, I meet with Tony on a, on a regular basis. We talk almost daily, so I, n not too much slips by us uh, in that respect. Um, I guess that's it. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Then we're adjourned.